morning. Good morning. For today's communion, I'm going to be reading out of the book of John. And I'll be in the fourth chapter. And in the fourth chapter, we read the story of Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And in the 13th verse, Jesus tells her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give them will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. We are very fortunate that in Jesus we don't have to worry about ever feeling parched spiritually because Jesus went to the cross because he gave his life for us he has given us the Holy Spirit that keeps us uh, that maintains us that keeps us going that keeps us energized and Jesus has given us a promise something that we can hold on to something that we can look forward to that promise is that he's coming back again and that in him we are saved from our sin and that we are set apart from uh, judgment because of his sacrifice. That promise, the gift of the Holy Spirit, those are things that, that quench that thirst that people who don't have Jesus, I imagine, must feel that you know they, they look for something that they cannot find. They try to find the meaning of life. They, they search and search the world over. Uh, the Fountain of Youth was such a, such a uh, uh, myth or a story that people would tell because people were so fascinated with keeping themselves from death. But as Christians, with that, with that life water flowing through us, the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, we know that Death holds no uh, uh, condemnation. It holds nothing over us. We know that after we pass on from this world, there is so much more. And that all begins right here. It begins with Jesus giving his life for us. And as we come to the communion table today, let's keep on our minds just what it means, uh, what, what we are celebrating, what we are remembering, that is, Jesus, his life, his love, that, that water that he has given us so that we may never thirst, but always have that completion, that feeling of, of uh, satisfaction in our hearts and our souls because of his love for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the well that we draw our spiritual water from. We thank you that it never goes dry. And we know that we can never uh, take enough out of it, that it's always there. And that well is, is the love that Jesus has given us through his sacrifice. He was selfless. He went to the cross for all of us. And we just thank you so much that he had that love inside of him, that he never gave up, that he went forward and gave up a, a beautiful life for sinners that do not deserve that sort of love. And we thank you, Father, and we pray that you help us to keep that on our hearts as we take communion today. And we just pray that you help us to keep it on our hearts as we leave here today. And just keep that worship going every day, loving Jesus the way that he loved us as closely as we can. Thank you, Father, so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Our series, the Book of Ephesians. Earlier this week, uh, Kathy asked me, she says, uh, What are you preaching on this week? And I, I told her, Well, I'm preaching on that, that section with the passage about wives being submission to, submissive to their husbands. <laughs> and her response was, Oh. <laughs> that one. <laughs> so, with that ringing endorsement, uh, we'll.
we'll, we'll start in. Ephesians 5, verse 21 through 6, verse, verses 9. And I'll get to that in just a little bit. <coughs> Have you ever had a really good boss? I mean, a really, really good boss in all of your employment history. I've, I've been blessed over the years to, I've had three just outstanding, wonderful bosses. And I still remember my first one very, very fondly. His name was Andy Fustich. And he was my boss at International Harvesters Wisconsin Steelworks up in South Chicago. And I was this lowly, wet behind the ears, cooperative education student with my first real job. And for some reason, Andy, who was my supervisor, he saw something in me that I don't think I saw in myself at that time. And he kind of just took me under his wing. And he mentored me, and he encouraged me, and he taught me, and he corrected me. And did I mention he encouraged me? And ultimately, you know, he, he just became a friend. And when I finished off my cooperative education experience at, at the steel mill and left there, I really came away as a changed person. You know, I, I just think I would have thrown myself in front of a bus for Andy Fustich. On the other side of the spectrum, have you ever had a really bad boss? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the stories we could tell about our really our really terrible bosses. You know, there's a popular saying in management circles, employees don't quit jobs, they quit managers. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. You know, most of us, when we start a new job, we're excited about it. I think we've all been there at one point or another. We look forward to learning new things. We look forward to developing new skills, meeting new people, being a part of something bigger than ourselves, maybe moving up the company ladder in some way or another. And of course, you know, the paycheck at the end of the week, that's always a nice little bonus. But then, you know, we start work and that initial excitement is just crushed. It's extinguished, you know, when we discover that we've got a really bad boss. And I've had a few of those too. Probably you have too, you know the type. You know, the micromanager who's constantly looking over your shoulder and correcting your work and telling you how to do your job. The boss who uh, takes your, your wonderful presentation that you've worked on and sticks his name on it and plasters it up in front of the meeting, takes credit for your work. Or the boss who just simply can't seem to show appreciation whatsoever or give recognition to their employees. The control freak boss, the boss who manages by fear that's always shouting and screaming and threatening. The boss who doesn't live up to his or her promises, so there's no trust. Or to, doesn't live up to the workplace values. The one who doesn't listen well, the one who doesn't lead by example, you know, the do as I say, not as I do boss. You know, we've, we've all seen people like that. And unfortunately, uh, I'm guessing a few of us have worked for people like that. You know, when given a chance, we just can't get away from bosses like that fast enough. And the company's all scratching their head wondering why, you know, this department has such amazingly high turnover. Well, okay, there's a reason for that. Anyway, I want you to hold on to those thoughts as we dive into this next passage in Ephesians, verses 5.21 through 6.9. Well, let's read that together. Paul writes, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wife, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for after all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. <coughs> this is a profound mystery when I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment of the promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy life, enjoy long life on earth. 
Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and respect and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when, you're, when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each of you for whatever good they do, whether they're slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. There is no favoritism with him. So Paul begins this section. I'm really going to focus in on this part uh, with the husbands and wives because the other two are basically expanding on the principles into other areas of relationship. But Paul begins this section with that encouragement, kind of blanket encouragement to all of us to submit to one another out of reverence of Christ. And then he goes on in this passage to give three examples of where that applies. It's not all the examples of where it applies, but three examples that he covers. And that's the husband-wife relationship, the parent-child relationship, and the master-slave. I think we could easily, since we don't have masters and slaves in, in this day and age, but we could easily substitute boss and employee for that kind of a relationship. It, I think it fits very well. It's the closest thing that we've got. And he gives instructions to both, both parties in these relationships. Wives, submit to your husbands, for example. And husbands, this is the kind of person that you need to be. And like I said, even though Paul gives us three examples, this notion of submission is not limited to those by any means, uh, to those three relationships. Just to get a handle on kind of the scope of what this submission relationship should be, I did a quick word study on the Greek word upotasso, which is translated, it's the one that's translated submit here. It shows up 38 times in the New Testament. So really, you know, in terms of Greek words, it's used quite a bit. And the takeaway of my brief study was that submission is applied to a wide range of different people, different entities. <coughs> Let me just read a few of them. In, in uh, Luke 2, 51, we're told that Jesus went down with his parents and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. So Jesus, as a good child, uh, was submissive to his parents. Luke 10, 17, the 72, after Jesus had sent the 72 out to minister and to cast out demons and to heal and to preach, they came back to him with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Same, same word. Romans 13, 1, let everyone be subject. Be subject here is that same word, submit. Let everyone submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. 1 Corinthians 15, 27. God has put all things in subjection under the feet of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 16, 15 and 16. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people, and to everyone who joins in the work or labors at it. So he's saying, submit to those people who are servants of the church, who are taking care of you. Titus 2.9, teach slaves to be subject or to submit to their masters in everything. James 4.7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Ephesians 5.21, submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. And finally, 1 Peter 5.5, 5, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. And that doesn't mean the elders of the church, but it's the older people. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. So just as these scriptures mention people to whom we're supposed to be in submission to, it also mentions a whole lot of people who are in the headship roles, the leadership roles, the people to whom we are in submission. These include our parents, older people, government authorities, uh, other Christians, bosses or masters, servants of the church. There's just a whole range of people that we're supposed to be in submission to. And who often we are the people that are being submitted to. And I think what comes, comes out of this little word study for me is that this submission headship relationship that Paul's talking about here is simply a fact of life for every one of us in a multitude of different contexts. We are all embedded in these social networks of relationships in which we either have a submissive role or a leadership or a headship role. 
you know, the employer boss, the employer or the boss, and the employee, the teacher student, the husband wife, the parent child, the governing authority, the citizen, Christian to Christian, older or younger, servant of the church, church member. We're, we're all embedded in these relationships. We all have people like this to whom we're in relationship. And it just goes on and on. And like I say, in these relationships, we're either the, we're either the head, the leader, or we're the one who's submitting. And they're everywhere, and we're constantly switching back and forth between these things. If our parents are still with us, for example, one minute we might be a father talking to a talking to one of our children. The next minute we switch over into a now we're the child talking to our parent, and the relationship changes. In my role at PBT, I supervise a couple of people. So one minute I'm uh, on a Skype with somebody in Indonesia and I'm supervising their project. The next minute my, bo my boss calls me and gives me a list of things to do. And now suddenly I'm in the submissive role. And it just switches back and forth. Um, you know, we submit to the governing authorities in our system of government. But at the same time, we also elect the government, governing authorities. So in a sense, they answer to us, or we hope they do. So like I say, as we go through our days, we're constantly flipping roles as we move from one relationship to another, from one role to another, from one position to another. And as I thought and prayed about this passage this week, you know, it really it occurred to me that really the critical piece in these relationships isn't the attitude of the one doing the submitting. Really the critical piece in these relationships, the thing that makes it work, is the character of the one acting as the leader or the head. You know, there isn't much of anything that Andy Fustich could have asked me to do that I wouldn't have done. Like I say, I, I think I'd have thrown myself in front of a bus for that guy. And it, because, it wasn't because Wisconsin Steelworks told me I needed to submit to Andy. No, it was because of who Andy was and how he related to me. In the right context, Submission just isn't that hard. I think what's hard is being the kind of person to whom others willingly submit. And I think it's in these relationships where we care about, you know, our family, our church, our employment. We just can't demand submission. There's a sense in which we've got to earn it. We've got to be the kind of people that, can, that, that people want to submit to. In those relationships. I, I guess we could demand it. Problem is, when we take that approach, it tends to blow up in our faces. You know, the parent who's just demanding and overbearing and just da, 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 all the time with their kids, you know, correcting them and, 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 and not being the nurturing kind of person. You know, those, those kids will put up with that when they're five, six, and seven, but when they're 15, 16, and 17, often it turns into an entirely different dynamic. The whole relationship blows up. You know, the domineering leadership in the church, you know, it'll work for a while, but inevitably it produces lack of unity in church splits. The do domineering leadership at work, you, you got, you know, this high turnover rate, and everybody's, like I say, scratching their head, wondering what's happening. You know, because of the nature of the, of the leader, the nature of the head. People don't respond well. And when they don't respond well, they, they tend to vote with their feet, so to speak. But fortunately, in this, in this passage, in, in his discussion of submission, Paul gives some guidelines about how we can be the kind of people, the kind of leader, the kind of head, in whatever role, head, role, headship role we have, whether it's a parent, or a husband, or an employee, or a teacher, or whatever, he, he gives us some guidelines about how to be that kind of person. And he begins right away in the discussion of the relationship of husbands and wives. And I want you to notice something about this. Notice how much Paul, how much space Paul gives to each side of the relationship. He starts with a fairly small section, three, three verses about wives submitting to their husband. And then he launches into a much more extensive section, eight verses, about the husband. And the kind of person he needs to be using Jesus and the church as the model. Basically, what Paul says is that Jesus is the example, the model of the kind of person that we need to be whenever we are in a leadership or a headship role. In this passage, he points to three fundamental truths about this. <coughs> Sorry, I've done with a cold this week. I'm over it, except for all the... Um, 
Yeah, in this passage, he points to three fundamental truths about good headship. And the first one is, in verse, 20, in verse 25, he says, it isn't about you. Isn't that the main problem with bad bosses, if, if you ever had one? For them, it is about them. It's about their reputation, their productivity, their department, their advancement, their standing in the company, the size of their office, their bonus, whatever. And for these people, these bad bosses, the employees are just a tool, a means to an end, a means to their end of getting what they want, of getting the recognition or the money or the office or whatever. We are merely an, an, uh, a means to their end. But Paul takes this and he turns it upside down. And he tells husbands, husbands, love your wife, and this is the critical part, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And I think in this, he's, he's really echoing Jesus' own words to his disciples about kingdom leadership and what that means. Jesus in Mark 10, verses 42 through 45, we read that Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Headship or leadership in the kingdom is defined in terms of sacrificial servanthood. So in this relationship between submit, submit, submission and headship, the headship is the servant. The headship is the, is, is, is the slave. The headship is the one who dies to himself for the sake of the person doing the submitting. Kingdom leadership, kingdom headship, is putting the needs and well-being of the other ahead of ourselves. And it's Jesus, and I'm paraphrasing uh, Philippians 2 here, who, although he was and is God, with all that that means in terms of status and power and position in the universe, it was Jesus who set aside all of his rights, all of his privileges of that identity as God in order to come to earth and live as a man with all the limitations of that identity to die a shameful death on the cross for the simple reason that he loves you and he loves me. He, he laid it all out. He gave it all up for you and me. You want to see submission? That's where it starts. Once we understand that, once we grasp that, once we believe who Jesus is, what he did for us, how, we can how can we respond otherwise than to give our lives to him? That's the transforming power of grace. That's the foundation for submission. That's why we submit to Christ, because we can see in him the amazing sacrifice and love that he made for us. You want submission as a husband, parent, elder, boss, Christian? Well, be that kind of person. Be the kind of person that Jesus was in putting the well-being of the other person ahead of our own. Put their needs, their desires, their emotional, their spiritual, their physical well-being ahead of our own. And that's whether we're talking about our spouse, our children, an employee, or a fellow Christian. Do that. Be that person. Be that guy. Be that gal. And we'll see some. Like I said, I would, have, I would have walked in front of a bus for Andy because he was that kind of person. Which brings us to the second point that Paul makes. It is about the other person. Ephesians 5, 26-27. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word. And he's talking about the church. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain, without wrinkle, without any other blemish, but holy and blameless. What a beautiful picture Paul paints of the purpose of Jesus' life and death. He gave himself up. He went through the cross for us. To make us clean, radiant, holy, blameless. He gave himself up not just so that we could be saved, but so that we could be transformed, remade into the likeness of Christ. To be the people that he wanted, that we were created to be. It was about us. I heard it said, and I really believe this, that if, we were, if you or I were the only sinner on earth, Jesus would have died for us. He loves us that much. He truly cares about us individually, 
and he's highly invested as much as anyone can possibly be in our well-being. And that's the foundation of our submission. You know, there's a growing movement in the business in the business world towards embracing these principles, and companies that embrace them have actually found that they work. You know, this whole servant leadership idea that Jesus talks about. Um, companies that have tried it often experience amazing results. Cheryl Bachelder, uh, in 2007, she took over as CEO of Popeye's Chicken. And Popeye's Chicken at the time was a company in decline. The guest visits had been declining for years. The restaurants, the per restaurant sales, the profits were, were negative. The company stock price had dropped from $34 a share in 2002 to $13 a share in 2007. The brand was stagnant. Relationships between the company and its franchise owners were strained. And then Cheryl took over. Seven years later, 2014, sales were up 25%. Profits were up 40%. Market share had grown from 14 to 20, 21%. The franchisees, the people that were out there actually doing, this, doing the work, they were ecstatic. And uh, they began reinvesting in the brand. Many remodeled their restaurants and they were building new ones around the world. What, the, what was the difference? What happened in those seven years? Well, Bachelder says that it was a conscious decision to create a new workplace with, with rigorous measures in place where people were treated with respect and dignity and yet challenged to perform at the highest level. And she outlines her philosophy. She said, we needed to serve the people who have invested the most in Popeyes. And this was their franchisees, their franchise owners. <laughs> this means that that meant that Bach Elder and her team shined the spotlight on the restaurant owners, listening and responding to their needs. Self-serving leaders were filtered out as collaboration increased and people were valued. And by improving the franchisee experience through the practices of servant leadership, customer experience became richer and more satisfying, leading to more loyal customers. I like the phrase that was in that little, little piece, shine the spotlight. When we're in a headship position, that's a good question to ask. Who are, who are we shining the spotlight on? Who are we focused on? Who's more important? Whose physical, spiritual, emotional well-being? Whose growth, whose security, whose development is the focus of this relationship? When that focus is squarely on the other person, I think submission pretty much takes care of itself. You lead like that, people, people follow. People want to follow leaders like that, that are invested in them. Which brings us to a final point that Paul makes. When we get this right, when we get this right, it creates a powerful bond and a powerful relationship. Verses 28 through 33. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives with their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Paul gives us two examples of this bond. Christ and the church, the husband and wife. And in each of he applies the same symbol. When this works, when you have Biblical headship and biblical submission coming together, they become one body, they become one organism. A profound unity develops between the this, this self sacrificing headship on the one hand, submission on the other. And this isn't to say that there's no tensions in marriage. You know, we're, not, we're not high in the sky, Pollyanna's here. We know that there's issues, there's tensions, there's times when we're like this with each other. Same in a, in a teacher. Student relationship, same with an employee-boss relationship, same with any relationship. As I've said before, you know, we're all ordinary and cantankerous at times. But when these communities, when these relationships, when these families, when these organizations, when these churches are built on these principles, when we submit to one another and when we serve one another, we build communities and churches and families that can withstand the, 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 the strains, that can withstand the conflict. Because the unity trumps the conflict. When it's not built on these principles, well, whatever the organization is, like I say, people tend to vote with their feet. And that's whether we're talking about a family, a church, a business, or a friendship. You know, I'm always a little bit apprehensive about preaching this passage because I think over the years since Paul wrote it, 
People have often used this to justify some very unhealthy relationships. Kind of a club to keep people in line. Uh, whether that's wives or children or church members. Uh, they've used it in ways that Paul never intended. I think Paul would have been appalled at that misuse of his words because what he's talking about here is so radically different from that. What he's talking about is radical headship. And he's talking about that a, a, a bit more than he's talking about submission. He's talking about leaders in whatever context who keep the spotlight shining on the people that they're serving. The people they lead. He's talking about leaders who sacrifice, who put the needs of others first, following the example of Jesus. And I think Paul puts the spotlight on that. Even though he's talking about both sides, I think the spotlight is really on that. He did that because he knows. You get that piece right, and the rest of it's going to follow. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for these, these instructions that you've given us through Paul. And uh, we really pray that in whatever context we live in, where we have a relationship with leadership or headship, that you would make us like Jesus, that you'd make us the people that he's calling us to be, that you'd keep the spotlight on, on the people whom we, whom we serve and on the people who uh, rely on us and depend on us. But Father, we could, we could be the sacrificial leaders that you want us to be, because we know when we do that, the other half of the equation, the submission half of the equation, just isn't all part. And so, Father, help us to live this out through the week. Help us to uh, be those people. Help us to build our communities, our churches, our church, and our families, every relationship that falls in this category. Help us to build those on the example that Jesus gives us. It's in his name.